This is Andy Peroff, Boxing Social in association with Betfred. I'm joined by promoter Eddie Hearn here in Manchester. Eddie, let's just work our way through the card, start from top to bottom. John O'Carroll with a brilliant performance against Scott Quigg and the stoppage victory at the end there. What did you make of their fight? I thought it was a tale of two stories. I think one guy who's probably come to the end of his career, who looked good in the gym, felt good, and sometimes when you get out there in the ring or to the crease or on the field, you just haven't got the timing anymore. Couple that with a great performance from John O'Carroll, tremendous feet, great movement, all the things that he needed to do to drive Scott Quick mad um, in the ring, especially when his time was off. Just put that down a little bit. Sorry, and um, I, thought, I thought John O'Carroll was brilliant. And you know, it was sad to see, particularly once the fight got to about seven or eight rounds, when you realise that there was no way back for Quick, he would go all night. He would have gone for 30 rounds. And I thought the towel came in, should have come in. Um, you know, some, I think some people say on social media they should have pulled him out earlier. It's difficult, you know, when he's not getting hurt badly, but he's, got, he's getting picked off non-stop. But when the output went from Scott Quigg, you know, in the opening five or six rounds, you could tell his timing weren't there, but he was still landing shots. He looked like he could be dangerous in the fight. As the fight went on, he looked like he was no longer dangerous. And that's when you've got to get him out of the fight. You know, the interview at the end, with Sky was, was brutal, very honest from Scott Quick. And, uh, you know, whilst it's never my decision and you should always let the fighter decide, I think that's his lot. You know, I don't think that he's going to want to operate at a lower level than that. He's had a wonderful career. He's had huge nights here. You know, he's had huge paydays, seven-figure paydays. He's filled out arenas. You know, he's, he's made enough money to leave the sport safely and say that probably I've done everything that I could have done in the sport. And when you leave your job, sport, whatever it is, knowing you've done that, you can live a nice life. And I'm sure he's got a lot to give back to boxing. But tonight, as Jono said in the build-up, it is his time. You know, a time of a 27-year-old that has got it in his legs, that has still got the timing, that has got the freshness. And, you know, he's going to go on. And I think I'd like to see him fight for a world title this year. We're quite through the card. Obviously, Zach Parker defeating yeah. Rowan Murdoch. What did you make of Zach's victory? I thought it was a good fight and a good performance. Um, Zach Parker, I think, is going to be... In very interesting fights at 168 pounds. I think he's big, he's strong. Sometimes, I think tonight, at times, he didn't show the confidence to go on and do what he did in the 11th. I think he could have done in the 8th or 9th round. And uh, I was saying to his guys, you know, put the pressure on now. Because if he would have won on points, it would have been a good performance. But to get the stoppage and a good knockout, it goes, you know, people remember that. Fans remember that. Broadcasters remember that. And, you know, he's in a position now where he's going to be number one with the WBO. If Canelo fights Billy Joe Saunders, he's going to be mandatory to the winner. So it's a big night for Zach Parker. He's got a long way to improve to mix at those levels. But I thought it was a really good performance in a good fight. Huey Fury, Pavel. So obviously how Huey Fury picking up a stoppage victory, impressed by him? Actually was. I think Huey Fury gets too much stick, to be honest with you. I mean, he's up against it. His cousin's Tyson Fury. You know, he's 26 years of age now. At 25 and 24, he was fighting for the world heavyweight title against Joseph Parker. He went to Bulgaria to fight Kubrat Pulev. He boxed Alexander Povetkin. And tonight, I thought he looked nice and spiteful. He did all the things that he said he was going to do. Pavel Sauer is not Povetkin and Parker and those guys, but he is a decent heavyweight that doesn't really get stopped. Huey Fury is supposed to be a guy that doesn't punch very hard. I thought tonight he was punching very hard, very sharply. And actually, I think he's right up there in terms of emerging heavyweights. Even though he's lost at the highest level, I kind of feel like he's, he's a guy that could be 18, 19 and 0, being unbeaten. But because he's jumped in those fights, and fair play to him, you've got... You know, as a fan, you can't have it both ways. You know, some may say, oh, he's, you know, he's a bit boring, he moves a lot, and tonight he didn't do it. But then if you want to do that, you've got to give him respect when he jumps in those other kind of fights at that stage in his career. So to get a heavyweight who's 26, that has his movement, that could have his power, he's going to grow, he's going to develop that power. I think, he, I think he's a bit of a dark horse, to be honest with you. We'll look to box him on the Usyk Chisora card uh, or the AJ card, and I think he needs a good step up now, top 15 heavyweight in the world. And I, I believe he'll, he'll get another shot at the World Heavyweight title in time. Anthony Fowler didn't get a chance to showcase his talents fully tonight with what he's worked on with Shane McGuigan, mm. but what can we take away from Anthony's Nothing week? really. I mean, it was a kick, like, it's horrible when that happens, you know. You get a phone call on, what was it, Tuesday or something like that. Jack Flatley's fractured his ankle, wanted to go through with a fight, just couldn't, couldn't carry on. You're phoning around the world trying to find someone. You find one guy, then all of a sudden he fails a medical. Then you find another guy, he ain't got a visa. He lies to you about his passport. Then you get another guy in Tete, who we've had over before, who he's boxed John Ryder before, went, I don't know, six or seven rounds with John Ryder. Decent enough, come over, had no grip on his shoes and was shot to pieces. It's the truth. Like, it, was, it, was, it was hard to watch. 
it's almost embarrassing. And if, if, it, if those things hadn't have happened, I would have been seriously fucked off, to be honest with you. But there's not a lot you can do about it. You just have to take it on the chin and say, a bit of a waste of time. But Fowler got out, he got paid, he got all the things that he worked on with Shane McGuigan, didn't see it in full, but probably needs a, just another little run out under Shane before he fights Fitz in July. Got more quick ones from me, Eddie. What is the latest with Billy Joe and Canelo? Not a lot. They've sent us a contract. We've sent our comments back and we're waiting to hear from them. So right now, no deal, no done deal, but we're ready to go. I believe a deal will get completed, but it's not done of yet. Finally, Frank Warren responded to some of your comments previously about speaking to Bob Arum, trying to arrange a Joshua Fury fight. Frank said that what you said is untrue and it's lies. Bob Arum's assured him there's been no conversations between the two of you. Thoughts and... Uh, reply to that. Thoughts is my nose has just gone and wrapped around the Manchester Arena seven times. What, what do you think? Do you think that... I mean, I've had about half a dozen conversations with Bob Arum since the Fury Wilder fight. We've talked about the deal. We've talked about the TV companies. We've talked about the split. We've talked about the date. We've talked about the site. And these are all wrapped in with the Kubrat Pula. What, what does Frank think that I'm going to speak to Bob Arum all these times and not talk about Fury... Joshua, it's the biggest fight in the world. So it's not my fault that Bob hasn't told Frank that they haven't been discussing. On our side, it's very straightforward. Just talk to me and we'll get it done. I don't know. He says he's in charge. He says he's in charge. He says he's in charge. But of course I've spoke to Bob Arum six or seven times. We've discussed virtually everything. We've talked about step-aside money. We've talked about the Pulev fight. We've talked about when the fight would happen. We've talked about how it would work on ESPN and DAZN. We've talked about BT. We've talked about Sky. It's not illegal. You know what I mean? Well, so, so, so keep, does it, by the way, we're more than happy to sit around a table with Frank Warren and Bob Arum and MTK and everybody. I'm just telling you, Bob Arum's calling me non-stop. I'm calling him about stuff. And we're talking about Crawford, Brooke, Joshua, Pulev, Fury. This is what we do when you communicate. Unfortunately, I've never had a conversation with Frank Warren, but I'm more than happy to. He can call me up if he wants. We sit around a table. And we may end up sitting around a table all together. But it doesn't have stop me having a conversation with Bob Arum about the biggest fight in world boxing when he's Tyson Fury's promoter. So I don't know why he wants to call me a liar for saying I've spoke to Bob Arum. But I've not only spoke to Bob Arum. I've spoke to Bob Arum about basically every issue around the deal. There's been no numbers. There's been nothing discussed. We're talking about how the deal works, when it can happen, and where it can happen. And all those conversations have been extremely positive. Cheers, Eddie. Thank you.